stream. All right, everybody. It is two o'clock Mountain Time, four o'clock Eastern Time. I'm here with Bryson Bort and George Archiles. Is that how you say your last name? Orchiges. Ah, Orchiges. It's only seven years. I know you, man. It's all good. Ah, it's all right. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd, like welcome, <laughs> I'd like to welcome both here. They're going to give a talk on adversarial emulation with the C2 matrix. Thank you very much, and take it away. Well, we ran a Twitter poll because in the olden days of the hacksing, speakers used to get iced. And so with that, Smirnoff Original, which is, I'm sure, just as gross and just as tasteless as the rest of them, is what won. So in honor of the olden days, just like a virtual conference, we are going to be drinking one of these. So cheers, George, to you. Cheers, sir. Oh, that tastes horrible. Oh, my God. That's so gross. Hmm. Ah. All right. All uh, right. We ready? Yes. Oh, man. Wow, ah. that does throw you off. That <laughs> 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 is so gross. All right. So, presenting. All right. So, we are going to be talking on adversarial emulation. And you can see our unicorn is sunny like they were in San Diego. So, we are setting the mindset that we are all in California together. The key to this talk is we are going to be talking about how to shift from a win-centric mindset, aka ego-driven, to business-driven for results. All too often, red teams, hackers, pen testers get carried away with trying to win. And the industry has started to shift now where businesses are beginning to look for results. How do we work together? Of course, the arrow is purple for a reason. What do you think that reason is, George? And only one of us talk at a time? Well, sorry. So, yeah, purple is uh, how my daughter would say, how you make what happens when you combine red and blue together. And really being efficient and business-centric. It's all about the purple team now. The Gruck tweeted a few years ago, give a man an O-Day and he'll have access for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll have access for life. Now, I started with this tweet for two reasons. One, phishing, business email compromise, is the majority access method that attackers use in the real world. And it works for multiple reasons. One, statistics are in my favor. I can send you as many fishes as I want. The cost difference to send one email to 10 million emails is relatively negligible. And statistics are in my favor because I just have to get somebody to click. Two, this is the theory of this talk. So we're going to be talking a lot about conceptual framework. We're not going to deep dive into PowerShell. We're not going to deep dive into any particular framework. What we're going to do is we're going to give you a different way to look at the problem. We're going to give you a different way to think through the problem. And in addition, we're going to provide you a number of technical resources that we have built and shared that we will continue to populate, hopefully with some of y'all's help, after this talk to help make you better in the long term. That's right. So first of all, who am I? I'm the unicorn guy. I'm also on the board of advisors to the Army Cyber Institute. I do some work for CISA at DHS. And I'm a senior fellow of national security and cybersecurity at R Street. Mostly I'm our industry silly unicorn. And I'm George Orchiez. I have been in offensive security for coming up on 10 years now at a large financial. Industry contributions include the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, a threat-led penetration testing framework that we use globally for Red Team and adversary emulation. I teach for SANS. I have a Red Team course and uh, other community things like ISSA. Shout out to them. And way back when, I wrote a book on an operating system you should not be running, which is Windows 7. Speaking of books, I got some of these to give away in this talk for whoever comes up with the nice, the best question over on the channel. So that is uh, track two talks. I'll be monitoring while uh, Bryson speaks. Yeah, Thanks. so please participate. We love questions, we love comments. The heckling probably won't work so well because you're muted, but we do have several books to give away on the definitive guide to red team operations and development written by Joe Vest and James Tuberville. All right, so obviously I've talked about who I am a little bit, but the one thing I just kind of want to create here is the idea that I believe in the post-access space, which is primarily where we're looking at red teaming, that 
the defender is not as weak as we all like to think. One of the things that I've always found strange is why in information security of all of the disciplines in humankind, is it the one place where it seems like somebody else knows my stuff better than I do? And that just continued to, to sort of rattle around in my head. And I kept thinking, that can't possibly, that can't be true. And the first place it's not true is in communications. When an attacker gains access, when they pop shell, when they land with a stage zero, when they build that stage zero up into a multi-stage campaigns, they start moving to a place of interest and they need to communicate, one, to be able to do that because they have to have that command and control to tell it what to do. And also it's kind of hard to steal anything if you can't take anything out. So for those two reasons, they need to communicate. And the way they do that is over the communications that are already organic to that enterprise. I can't bring my own wires to the table and I can't bring my own communication protocols to the table. I have to use what's already there because if I don't, I stick out. And so one of the core elements of the attacker is blending in with what's already organic to that environment. How do they talk? When do they talk? What ways do they talk? And being a part of that. And then the second part was, well, all right, so that's, that's limited. I can only talk so many ways. There's only so many communication protocols in the world, and a company's only going to be using so many of those. But what does an attacker do as a part of that? And the capabilities, what they do, what they bring to the table that actually allows them to accomplish their goal is also bounded. There's only so many things an attacker can do. Now, there might be a number of ways to do those things, but the behaviors themselves are actually finite as well. And so I came up with this idea that I call the bounded attack space philosophy, which is that while exploitation, whether that's technical, whether that's physical, whether that's social, my means to get there is infinite. But what I do once I'm there is actually a finite space of possibility. And furthermore, what's the value of post-exploitation? When we start looking at post-exploitation, we're now primarily dealing with the largest surface area of every organization. And guess what? It's not technical. It's people. It's all the different kinds of users. And here we have a representative example of some of the different kinds of users from the folks who don't know how to turn their computer off and on to the engineers who always want to be in charge of their own station to the guy or gal who always thinks they know what they're doing, to Elon Musk, whatever the hell he's doing. And then of course, somebody else that's coming in and doing what they want to do. So now we're gonna get into setting the classic question of pen test versus adversary emulation. So we're all speaking the same language as well as we're gonna delve into some concepts in this section, talking about some conflict of industry definitions and terms. And those are actually some of the questions we got. So shout out to Juicebox and Sham. Uh, that's exactly what we're gonna talk about here, just to level set. We can't just get to adversary emulation. There's a maturity model on a way to get there. And what we found speaking with a number of you that have been doing this for a while, a number of your uh, organizations, is that you start with vulnerability scanning. You scan a bunch of systems, you run your Nessus, your Nexpose, whatever vulnerability scanner, app scan, whatever, if it's a web app, and you get a very long report. That's step one. Then you actually do vulnerability assessment that involves a human looking at those results, doing some triaging, thinking, saying, all right, this is internal, it's a lab box, maybe it's a production system on the internet, and actually doing some correct risk scoring with CVSS do a scoring system and really set different boundaries as to should this be fixed today, tomorrow, uh, in 90 days or never fixed. From there, we have penetration testing. And the main difference there is that you're actually going to exploit vulnerabilities. And this is really where a lot of us have been for quite a bit, but then regulators came and kind of watered down what a pen test is and confined us to these very limited scopes. PCI is probably one of the best examples that you can only pen test a certain scope within their environment once a year. You only can hit certain IPs and you can only attack during certain times and you can't do social engineering. So because of that, kind of the term red teaming was started to be used as a no scope pen test or a full scope pen test where you actually emulate and do the same tactics, techniques, and procedures as 
a malicious actor that involves understanding the actor who is likely to attack you. Each organization is going to have a different threat model. And then there you get to actually do these tests. Then the difference between a red team and a purple team is that a red team assessment will be blind. That means most people in the target organization are not going to know about this. You generally do this for a month, two, three months. Some organizations are doing this for longer. And then you come back at the end of that with your reports and all that, and you show how you did it. And the blue team gets some value there. But where we're going to is this purple team concept. Now, all the previous ones you're still doing, right? You're not going to stop doing vulnerability scanning. You're not going to stop doing your pen test or your blind red team maybe once a year. But you can do some of these purple team engagements to be more efficient. And purple team is just that, combining red and blue. Set them together and try these TTPs. See what should happen, what should be caught, what should be detected, what should have an alert maybe at the SOC or incident response should be able to see. And that will make you much more efficient in the short term to catch some of these one-offs. In addition, orienting you to a format that we're using in this presentation, you'll notice in the bottom right, we have a link. That link goes to a much more extended discussion on the maturity model here, in this case by George Orchias. And throughout the presentation, we will have additional links for documentation, videos, websites, all providing you additional information so that you can build up your sources after this talk for further detail. So penetration testing, like we discussed, is primarily exploitation focused. We're looking at getting access. And popping shells is rewarding. There is nothing more fun than to be sitting there, banging away at something, and then just like war games, the green glow of the terminal lights you up as you finally get in and you're on. Now, the change here is that about 20 or 30 years ago, this was all hacking was, was a one person team focused on exploitation and getting that shell. And there are multiple things that have changed in the environment where we still, as George discussed, want to look at penetration testing because it's an important aspect of system hardening. I'm looking at my surface area analysis. How do I get in? What is my risk to somebody getting in? As I discussed previously, though, that's a near infinite space. And that's one of the challenges that we have in information security. It's trying to measure something out of infinity is a sliding scale. Furthermore, defenses got good. The software got good. The software got complex and good. Microsoft Windows is now a hard target. It used to be Swiss cheese. And so that's one of the reasons that we've now seen the shift where while penetration testing used to be the entire kill cycle, kill chain, it's no longer anymore, and it's now just a part of an entire chain. Furthermore, there's a focus on crown jewels or bus. Getting, to admin, getting domain admin is good, but only getting domain admin is not so good, because if I get in, I escalate, and I just own domain and walk out, what does the business learn? Furthermore, that's not necessarily what we see in the real world for what an adversary would is going to do. So of course, the topic here is adversarial emulation. What we're trying to do is getting out of technically accomplishing something just interesting that's technical and understanding in the context of business results, which means we need to look at what do we see in the real world because that's the real threat model. Engagements are typically shorter for penetration testing because of course, a lot of things are compliance driven. A lot of folks in information security kind of sneer at this concept of compliance-driven security because, of course, we all know while compliance isn't security, compliance is the starting point for a business to legally be able to function. If I have a requirement to go do a pen test to get my check once a year that I am legally valid as a business to operate, that's the starting point that a business is going to begin to think of. So red team and penetration testing. Internal red teams are going to be conducting repeated engagement. They're going to be different philosophies, different techniques, different capabilities based on whether you're internal or external for lots of different reasons. Internal is focused on repeated engagements and remediation. One of the advantages can be that they have privileged or insider knowledge because they actually work inside that organization. A lot of organizations try to almost push their red team to the side for different reasons. And that's, that's kind of that constant tension between how do we create a black box test versus a gray box versus a white box test, which we'll, we'll define shortly. 
And then it, the external red team is useful because it offers a different perspective. They have industry experience. So here's a chance to benchmark, okay, I'm a financial and what do I look like compared to other financials? And I can hire a red team who's had experience doing those kinds of engagements against other financials so I can get an industry benchmark. The challenge though, of course, is these are incredibly limited by resource and money. So you're gonna get snapshots in time. One of the challenges with the red team is I can only take, do so much in so much time. And so I end up being forced to do what I call more of a surgical strike. I have to try to focus on a few things, get in a few places, do that quickly, demonstrate my value as fast as possible because that's all the time I either have with how much money the client's willing to spend or how much time the client is willing to spend. And George, you are quite familiar with internal red teams. Yeah, so that, like that, yeah we're, we're actually getting some very good questions about doing rotation between red and blue. And does, you know, do you get diminishing returns because of the internal red team? And uh, like I said, I've, I've been there for, uh, well, really had the red team at this financial for about four to five years. And yes, we do know the environment way better. That's why it's often, even though if you have an internal red team, sometimes it's good, maybe every two years or something like that, get a real external red team to come and, and do an adversary emulation to see what they find. The good thing about the internal red team is that they already know a lot, so they're going to focus their testing on way more advanced type of techniques and procedures that they know will get through, and that really brings out the reasoning of why you should fix those. So I believe both of them bring value. You shouldn't replace either of them. Even if you have an internal red team, you'll be able to do more purple teaming for sure, but also contract an external team every once in a while so that you get that real third party, no strings attached, no prior knowledge uh, tested. Back to you. One of the best insights I got on this was actually at Wild West Hacking Fest in Deadwood, South Dakota last year in October. And there were a group of us sitting around at a table and we were talking about conference attendees. And Wild West Hack Fest, Wild Way West Hack Fest, is primarily a conference with an offensive security focus. And what's interesting though, is that means that probably only about 20, 25% of the attendees are actually out of offensive security. Red team, penetration testing, 70, 80% are blue team or IT. And the other contrast to that was it was interesting because if you go to a blue team or an IT conference, almost nobody from offensive security attends those, which I think is a bad thing. There's certainly a lot of folks. You don't typically get started in red team. You usually grow from having learned how an environment works. In fact, uh, Jeff McJunkin, who was on Discord earlier today, was talking about how he learned PowerShell as an exchange administrator before he went over into offensive security. And so part of what I would like to offer, because I'm willing to bet that the 100 or so attendees that are on right now, that most of you are not actually in the red team space, that one, that's okay. Sorry, I just got distracted because Jeff just tagged me as I called him out. That cross-training is absolutely applicable. We, we recommend a process and a framework here that encourages red and blue to work together at a doctrinal level. But at that same time, at the personal level, we absolutely believe that the two sides should be cross-training and sharing information because that's the best way to have a business area focus from a blue team side of why does the red team engagement need to be something that is binary? They go away and they just come back with results. When I think about purple teaming, what I like to think about is the fact that a red team is going to be something that is done in stages. Hey, let's validate application whitelisting. Let's validate application whitelisting as many different places as we can throughout this enterprise. And then once we do that, let's whitelist the campaign. So we'll come together and say, hey, here's what we learned. Let's fix those things. Now let's whitelist this campaign and go to the next level. We've now just emulated an adversary by their ability to defeat application whitelisting. I didn't have to do anything technically complicated to do that. I just had to coordinate with the blue team that said, all right, this executable, this Python script, this DLL, whatever that payload is, we're going to whitelist it. And now that's the equivalent of the Chinese defeating our application whitelisting control and the campaign is able to progress and we're able to do that collaboratively. Nobody on this planet is going to spend the same amount of time, resource, or money 
as a true adversary to be able to emulate those things. So instead of actually trying to do it at that level technically, it's something with a simple handshake, we can accomplish the same goal. So on that note, this brings up the debate in our industry about some terms, emulation versus simulation. So I'm gonna start with Tim Malcolm Vetter, who is the enterprise red team lead at Fortune One. And he notes the dictionary definition of emulation as a reproduction, simulation as an imitation, and then the concept of a false flag, which is a covert operation designed to deceive by creating the appearance of a particular party or group. So false flag operations are where I might repurpose malware. So if I'm the Russians, I repurpose Chinese malware, and then I launch an attack on America, the immediate technical forensic analysis is going to look like I'm the Chinese because I reused Chinese code and I've now given a false flag cover of looking like something that I'm not. And he uses this as a call to the red team because the red team in a false flag operation is now false flagging as an adversary. On the other hand, we have Katie Nichols, who during my talk at DerbyCon, quote, emulation is sort of in the spirit of but we can never match adversaries exactly, whereas simulation implies it's an exact match. So here we have <laughs> contraindicating terms around emulation versus simulation. And to make things even more complicated, we have more simulation with the breach and attack simulation space, where we now have different definitions of what simulation is. And so what I would offer is the reason that we chose the name emulation and adversarial emulation is because I believe that there's two levels that we're talking about. One is where am I trying to replicate the techniques, tactics, and procedures of an adversary that I want to measure my defensive controls against? The other is what exactly am I doing on a network or a host computer? So for example, if I am going to do ransomware, I can't actually do ransomware on a user's host computer because no assessment should ever impact operation. So how do I effectively simulate ransomware on a computer without effectively ransomware in the computer? And the example that I give, and you can look at this up online where I've demonstrated it, is creating arbitrary files, using local encryption to encrypt those files, calling back to my C2 server that I'm conducting the red team operation from. So I have host and network activities tied to ransomware, but I haven't actually affected the user's computer. So just kind of two different levels between actual operation of what happens on a computer and then where I'm trying to replicate the TTPs of an adversary. That's a lot of where we have this industry confusion tied into, of course, what Forrester and Gartner think that this is. Anything you want to add there, George? Yeah, I'm actually uh, just reading through. A lot of people say, you know, a lot of these are just buzzwords that I think in spirit, we're all agreeing that what we want to do is understand how an adversary works, which is what we're going to jump into right now, emulate that or actually test that, whether you want to call it simulate or emulate, and improve at the end of the day to improve the blue team, improve your detection, and your alerting, your prevention, and your people and processes. And so the comment on these being buzzwords of marketing jargon, certainly you're going to find that challenge throughout. There are lots of vendors, lots of products, all competing to try to communicate their own goals and their own agendas. But I would argue that in the practitioner community, it's really important that we try to come to a common understanding of what we mean and why that confusion is, because at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to protect our businesses. That's what we're hired for. Yeah, and not and not let it get watered down like we let penetration testing get watered down to mean one IP address and just a little bit of exploitation here or there. <laughs> the proverbial Nessus scan report is a pen test. Yeah, exactly. So what do we need to do to be able to effectively do adversary emulation? So the key here is one, flexibility, because I need to be able to change what I'm doing at the host and the network level to be able to replicate, and I keep using replicate because I'm now avoiding the use of the term emulation, <laughs> to emulate that particular adversary, and it needs to be repeatable. And the reason it needs to be repeatable is that this should not be a one-off. 
this becomes something that when I've created that particular view of an adversary, I'm able to share that with DevOps. I'm able to share that with the SOC. I'm able to share that with the blue team. So that's something that they can take away and work around. And I build up my own baseline and library of my organization's emulated campaigns to be able to do that. So we talked about customization. I need to be able to change command and control. I need to be able to change what I'm doing. Repeatable. This helps me start to establish metrics of performance because the reality is that that organization is always changing. And with that change is going to be the potential degradation of controls. One thing I always like to point out to folks is how confident are you that controls are uniform throughout your enterprise, which means that however you feel you are protecting all of the employees in that company, particularly an international multinational company, do you think that the controls are all implemented equally across all of those computers? Kill chain insight. So this is where I talk about finding the defensive contours. Where can I uh, move down the, the kill chain of determining what works and what doesn't, and then together moving past that and then moving past that? And then automatable. So one of the challenges, of course, that we all have in our industry is the fact that we want to be able to make it easier for new folks, for junior folks to come up to speed. And so part of what I propose here is that you need to have this balance in your organization of the very knowledgeable experts who can build out these capabilities, who can define them with whatever set of tools that you're using, and that those can be pushed down so that more junior operators can work within those limits and operate them on the environment. So we talked briefly on white box versus black box. This is a contentious part of the way we do things. So white box is I have full insider knowledge. I am given all of the details for me to be able to begin like a well-established adversary versus black box, which means I just know the company I'm looking at. And I have to begin reconnaissance and intelligence collection to conduct my campaign. Part of what I think confuses this is one, this is a bit of, bit of a mix of surface area analysis and penetration testing. But my personal opinion on it is that I think all red teams should start from a white box perspective because I'm primarily looking at the business potential risk. What is that contextual risk of what happens once you get in? There's no risk to reconnaissance. There's just a question of what can you find. And the reality is going back to that nobody is ever going to invest the same amount of resources and time as a committed adversary. I'm not aware of any red team that's ever been hired for a two to five year red team to do a patient and stealthy reconnaissance that also includes interacting with human assets for information. So this is just my personal view on why I think that red teams should start with a white box perspective. And there's absolutely nothing lost by even beginning your red team with set points within the enterprise. Um, I know several large companies that the red team begins from random hosts inside the enterprise and they begin from there because they just assume access. Defense validation. I have a question right about this of why should we automate this? And I think this is probably a, a great slide to answer that question that you know that people are asking. Okay. Do you want to take it? This goes back to the question uh, someone just asked, well, what's the value of automating some of these tests if they're TTPs? And the reason for that is that we want our red teams to focus on and think and continue to find new and, and, new and interesting ways of being able to do certain procedures, certain techniques. The example I want to give was that we found a particular issue and it required a lot of moving parts to get there. So for instance, a certain log, a certain event ID had to get turned on, then that event ID had to be logged locally, then it had to be sent to a log aggregator, from there it had to be sent to a SIM, do some sort of security analytics, and then eventually actually show up for the level one analyst to see because it's a TTP you can't prevent. It's just something we had to live with, but we had to detect it. And one of the reasons why we automated this and we created an automated method of doing that particular TTP, we were able to give that to the engineers. They would run it, see if that correct log was running. They did that multiple times, way better than having a red team or drop a C2, go through and do or run an atomic red team, et cetera. And then once they get that to their correct logging 
send it to the correct place, make sure that it's traversing the network, getting to where it needs to, then make sure that the analytics were working. They told me they ended up running this over 30 times. During that time, normally in tradition, you'd have your red team just redoing this, redoing this, redoing this. In this case, we can have them execute this particular controlled, you know, kind of synthetic type malware and be able to test it themselves and while our red team got to focus on others. So it's not even control validation at that point, it's really making sure it works. Then once you do have the control, you can automate that control validation piece to make sure nothing actually stops working, right? And you can do this for various DTPs and we'll, we'll get to the threat intel part and MITRE attack shortly. So back to you, Bryson. Yeah, so, so to emphasize there, one, that helps me build a library that the entire organization can start to use because I think that when we're looking at this defense validation, the red team's goal is to constantly be able to emulate the latest and greatest threat to that organization. And I emphasize that to that organization because not everything is a threat to everybody. Probably the best example I can give of that is actually, so this morning I was having a conversation with somebody and they were talking about, hey, nobody has ever looked at the threats to mining equipment. And my first comment was, well, what's the threat model there? I would say the threat there is more likely that somebody is going to be stealing equipment versus that somebody is going to try to manipulate this closed access industrial control equipment. So just because something can be done doesn't mean it's something you have to worry about. We can't worry about all of the things. So we need to find ways to reduce that burden for ourselves by automating as much as possible. And to that, that, that part is the emulating the behavior. So in this example, we talked about WannaCry. So if I go and get a sample of WannaCry, I can validate myself against that exact sample. So first problem we have, and this ties into a challenge for threat intelligence, is that sample is going to have a particular hash. It's going to behave a certain way. It's going to go to a particular IP or domain. Well, attackers already know that you're going to catch this stuff, which is why they already build in the ability to shift those things. It's relatively easy to cre create new signatures. It's also not that difficult to defeat signaturing techniques that defenders use. So I can even be the same thing and look like a different thing to you. And then it's not hard for me to constantly have changing bounce nodes and IPs and different things. This is part of one of the reasons why botnets can also be particularly interesting because they provide me my own basic Tor net for, of consumer products for C2. And so the goal here is being able to look at ransomware behaviors versus just a particular kind of ransomware is the emulation that we want to do. And then the executive perspective on defense validation is they're looking to validate their investment in products. They've spent a certain amount of money on tech, on process, and on people, and what they would like to know what works and what doesn't. Going back to the comment on marketing jargon, what am I actually getting versus the snake oil of what I've been sold? I cannot tell you how many places that have spent seven digits on a particular product, we go and we do a particular test, and they come back and they go, oh my God, we're, we're spending this amount of money and it didn't even catch that. There, <laughs> on one hand, there's no worse feeling in the world than realizing you spent a lot of money for something that didn't deliver. On the other hand, it's really good to know the truth. So as hard as it is to call that the emperor has no clothes, this is the executive interest in being able to do this. And then validating the investments in people. So a lot of things, when we look at this, the goal uh, across the defensive matrix of what does a red team do, it's looking at protection, it's looking at detection, and then it's looking at response. So part of that could be, is my SOC awake? Are they able to see these things? What should they have seen and when should they have been able to see it? Or in the case of most businesses, because the majority of businesses don't have their own internal SOC, what am I getting for the money that I'm spending with that managed service security provider? Are they meeting their SLA? Are they able to catch the obvious things? The threat intelligence today. Threat intelligence today is primarily driven by static identifiers. And the reality is those things are constantly changing. So it's disappointing. So one of my points on this is for us as an industry to be able to adapt we should not have the burden as practitioners in the red team and purple team space to go and read a 40 to 60 page analyst report to try to pull out the information for us to be able to emulate an adversary. So one piece of work that came out at last year's AttackCon, MITRE published an open source toolkit called TRAM. 
Tram does natural language processing to go through those reports and try to bubble that up for you. I think that's a good first step. I would argue that the threat intelligence industry needs to adapt even further, and they need to be creating not lengthy analyst reports, but machine readable for emulation. So instead of producing a 60-page report, they produce some sort of sticks or Yara-like format that we're able to ingest automatically, and that's something that we can put into all of our tools. So one of the things we're going to talk about here quickly, uh, shortly is one of the tools that George and I and several others created to help catalog and identify all of the command and control frameworks that are available out there, both open source as well as proprietary. And my point here is that if the threat intelligence industry creates a standard for all of us to build to, then all of those frameworks can now look to ingest that to automatically be able to replicate whatever they're trying to do. And of course, you can't get by without one reference to the Pyramid of Pain by David Bianco. The challenge here, of course, is threat intelligence at the bottom of hash, IPs, and domains needs to grow up toward the techniques, tactics, and procedures, which is really difficult to do given the current state of affairs. And then the final piece is one of the riskiest ways of, of doing this is neutered malware, where I go out, take a sample of something, bring it in, reverse engineer it, make sure that it's not harmful, as well as make sure that it's something I control. And now I can throw that exact same code out into my environment. Here is a great example. This is a call out to Katie. Katie no longer works at MITRE, actually. Katie now works at Red Canary. So thumbs up, Katie. But while she was at MITRE, she created this idea of how to look at a traditional threat intelligence report, pull it out, and then automatically correlate it using the MITRE attack matrix, which is where we see these different designations. So now I have the ability to start to look at what are the, the metadata of a threat to be able to emulate it, which leads us right into MITRE attack. Probably just about everything these days is centered around MITRE attack. MITRE attack is one of the major hot frameworks that everybody's going with. Most of it that you've seen is all enterprise attack, which is focused on delivery on through. They are fleshing out pre-attack. And then in addition, they're also building out an attack framework for ICS. That was published at the end of last year. So what MITRE attack does for us, and this goes back to that same, some of the same challenges we have in industry. One example of simulation would be that I run a box in here like account manipulation. So account manipulation in persistence to then trying to do bypass user account control. And the point is that I will, I will run this and I will get a score and then I will run bypass user account control and get a score and then I'll do something else separately. My argument is that's not emulation because if you look at the way an attacker works, an attacker is going to be state-based. My ability to do access token manipulation in privilege escalation is going to be dependent on what information I've gathered from being able to do one of these other techniques. My ability to do lateral movement is going to be radically different if I have privileges versus if I don't. And so the way I like to think about this is the MITRE attack framework should be looked at like a periodic table of elements. The individual elements combined together create a chemical equation, which is my ability to emulate an adversary. Them individually are just inert objects. So on top of that, They've also published sub-techniques. So in addition to the high-level periodic table, there's now a lot more depth in each one of those squares to go into the sub-techniques that, that match that. So just something to be aware of. I like the good thing about this is MITRE ATT&CK gives us a common language now to describe attacks and to discuss what's happening. But the challenge is don't get into a box focus. Don't get into a rigid adherence to what you think is in the framework. And there is no way to blanket test across all of MITRE ATT&CK and don't get caught up in, you know, we're green in this box, but yellow in this box. It's, it, it's, it's good as a way to describe what's happening, but do not, do not over-focus on it. And with that, we're going to go to George with the C2 Matrix. www.thec2matrix.com. This started, originally started when the folks over at SpectreOp said that they weren't going to support Empire anymore. This was around June, July 2019. And I went and asked some smart people like Jeff McJunkin, who's on here, and uh, Tim and Ed and a few people. I said, hey, what, what other C2s do you use? And I got a different answer for every person. 
then started just asking around more and more and found quite a bit of C2s without real, really knowing which ones worked. All of them GitHub code that you had to read quite a bit into. And uh, then talking with Bryson at, uh, what was that? It was DerbyCon. DerbyCon. We were talking about other, other C2s. I think you were playing with Caldera at that point or trying to play with Caldera at that point. Uh, I think it was pre-version 2. And we just started brainstorming of how cool it would be if you had a list of all the C2s with all the different features. Because so far, we've talked about getting threat intel, finding an adversary that's going to likely to attack you, getting out those TTPs, and then figuring out which C2 or what framework you can use that would emulate most closely to whatever adversary you want to do. And that's where uh, this came out. As you can see on the screenshot here, we have a number of different factors. I think we look at over 30 different things. In particular, focusing on the command and control ch channel, what protocols are used. If you read Threat Intel and malware, and we'll cover this shortly, you'll see a lot of it is over HTTP. But you see a number of them using others like HTTP2, SMB, ICMP, DNS over HTTPS. So really just bringing all these together, there's 35 of them right now. As you can see, it's almost completely full. And every time we get close to filling this matrix, a new one gets released, generally on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> so uh, it's a fun little project. It's been taking out quite a bit. You can follow at, at C2 Matrix on Twitter. And if you go to the next slide, I want to talk about a release we're going to do right now. So one of the things I kept hearing when we brought out the C2 matrix was, how do you actually get these installed? How do you make them run? What are the basics? And what we're releasing today is the how-to. So howto.thec2matrix.com. It started, it's populated only for Wild West Hackfest. So you're the first people to see this. And you can actually go through and click on any of the C2s and they'll tell you how to get it installed how to run it, and some of the basics around a listener, an agent, how to create that payload, et cetera. We also have a couple other things coming out because if you've ever tried to install any of these, you know, they aren't as straightforward as possible. So as a SANS instructor working with SANS, we are coming out with the Slingshot C2 Matrix Edition, which will have the top 10 C2s that we believe most people use. Also been working with the folks over at Offensive Security. Kali Linux already has PowerShell Empire 3.1, or actually 3.1.0. It is supported now by a team called BC Security. But by 2020.2, it will have 11 C2s on there. So uh, this is really allowing everyone to test these out. All of these are open source already. Most of them are. And then really the next phase is more strategic view on how to use the C2 matrix, which involves attack mapping and adversary mapping. So if we say, hey, uh, your, your CISO comes and says, you know, January 5th, first day back from work or to work from the holidays, these uh, Iranian threat actors are, are high risk now because of the current global affairs. What can APT 33 and 34 do to us? You can look at the matrix and say, all right, the C2s that are most likely to cover these TTPs are these. Go to the how to and test them out and actually have valid results for improving your detective and preventive controls. So all that's available right now, how to dot the C2 matrix. It's a work in progress. We do appreciate everyone's feedback and contributions. Uh, we also have these c2 matrix stickers that i wish i can give you all but if you contribute i've heard that you magically receive stickers at your house i don't know how that works but uh contributors have uh ha have been saying that they're receiving them so it's pretty cool back to you bryson so emphasis here one this is a community driven effort george and i and all the others are not able to do this on their own there are new C2 matrix, or excuse me, there are new C2 frameworks constantly coming out. There are updates to the ones that are currently in there. There are a lot of new ideas that we've been debating for the last few months on where we want to take this idea even further. We are looking for folks to get involved and to help. We want folks testing. We want folks writing how-tos. We want folks crafting how to emulate specific threats. 
obviously we are going to be releasing here in a short bit some new distributions, which will make it even easier because a lot of these will already be installed for you. So please reach out, work with us to help make this better for everybody in the community. One of the ones that I called out here is Caldera. And since we're short on time, this fortunately, I'm not going to do a big demo, but we provided some videos and some documentation walking through even more detail than what's currently available on the C2 Matrix website. So the GitHub for it, all of the docs. So the good news is Caldera is free. You'll notice they even say adversary emulation in their GitHub. So we're on a good site. The bad news is this is the object tree for Caldera. It is very complicated, which is all one of the reasons that this is a pretty powerful tool. I would summarize that this is a great tool to practice in a lab. A lot of the things that are required for installation, so here's some of the things you need for execution, make it difficult to use in a production environment, but it is a fantastic tool for emulation in a lab environment, it has a lot of capability. And you'll notice the links down at the bottom. So. On the left side is a thorough walkthrough, a written walkthrough that we are sharing on us setting up specific campaigns and how to do that. And then on the right is a link to the video for that. Quickly going through, do you notice any trends here? HTTP obviously rules the day. These are all available for sale for almost nothing. These are still in operation years later because they still work. I talked about network activities being a finite space. The emphasis I would put on here is the one place that an adversary can never fool you because they have to bend the laws of physics is on the wire at the network. When I go down and become a one and zero, I become a one and zero like everybody else. It's only by blending in with the traffic that I can try to be clever. Lateral movement, of course, is the most common thing to look for. Almost no adversary ends where they want to. I mean, excuse me, starts where they want to. They begin wherever they begin. They have to get where they need to get, which means they have to pivot throughout. And so there's pivoting, there's password spraying. A lot of folks don't look for that internally. Use of vulnerabilities inside. And then, of course, just basic tricks. Looking at that combination then from a defensive perspective is understanding, should these things be talking? Should these things be on the same network? Segmentation is your friend. Post activities, we talked about this. Sort of purple team. So we're going to skip real quick here to George doing a very fast summary yeah. of an actual purple team exercise. I actually got awesome questions. I want to thank everyone that's been putting in questions because we've been able to answer them subliminally about while we're still doing the slide. So purple team exercises. One of the things that someone commented is, you know, in your maturity module, can you just jump to purple team and not do red team or do red team after? And the answer is yes. This is just how some organizations matured. There are a number of them that did, went from pen testing to purple teaming and then doing blind red team. So by all means, whatever gets you there, gets you there. The purple team exercises, the way that we did it was blind test first where blue team hated the red team because we were internal and we come in and win. And that was our thought process back then, right? It was about winning and that's not the goal. The goal is to make blue better, to make your detective and preventive controls better, to train and improve your people process and technology. So we started doing these purple team exercises and the first one had to be in person just because of the psychological and the history behind it where it was very adversarial between blue and red. So there's an entire talk here on the bottom right that you can check out. And what's important about a purple team exercise is to choose those tactics, techniques, and procedures correctly. You don't want to choose TTPs that you know aren't going to get caught by anything. You actually want to choose TTPs that will be detected but not necessarily prevented, and especially doing this early on. So it takes a lot of planning ahead of time. Most red team exercises do as well. A lot of talks just focus on you know, initial access and, and defense evasion, but the actual prep time or a purple team or a red team exercise. Could be four weeks, could be eight weeks. And there's where you want to choose these TTPs and ensure that you're bringing value. So start with those TTPs that you know you detect, but requires a person to actually action, and then move on to test something more sophisticated or something that should work, something that might not work, really depending on, on what you want to do. So like I mentioned, there's a, a whole talk I did at the SANS Purple Team Summit, slides are there for running in in-person purple teaming but they're definitely high value and then 
Zena will be doing a presentation on ThoughtCon. I've actually been giving her a number of the lessons learned, so she's going to have more examples there as well. But definitely bringing value is the reason we do all of this, is to improve the defenses of our organizations or your customers if you're third party. It's not just about winning, which is exactly how Bryson started the conversation today. And if you do want a little more on this, this is my shameless plug. I am a SANS instructor, and there's a two-day red team exercise and adversary emulation course where we do everything we just talked about. We use threat intel. By luck of the draw, I chose an Iranian threat actor. So it was very timely in these past three months to emulate APT33. In the course, we use Empire, but you learn all the basics. And obviously, we cover the C2 matrix. So it's a two-day course. 50-50, so all hands-on, and you go into from initial access all the way to action on objectives, and it's a lot of fun. So reach out if you want to do that. SANS announced today that they will be moving all their in-person courses and conferences between now and June 1st to virtual, so uh, we'll still be supporting the community and anyone that signs up. So hopefully we see you there. Back to you, Bryson. We're done.